Hello and welcome to another interesting edition of your favorite parliamentary news magazine program on television, the Chamber Radio on City TV. My name is Chukman Tovoku. Parliament is back in session. This is the second session of the eighth parliament, the first meeting, of course. We'll be back after this break. Stay with us. City TV is live on DSTV. Go to channel 363. On Go TV, access City TV on channel 182. On a digital TV, please press the menu button on the remote control and run a new search on your TV. Take note that without an antenna, you cannot access City TV on your television. City TV can be accessed on a free to air digital box like the Go TV and Star Times box. City TV, it's your world. Welcome back from the break. Now, we will begin by bringing you a wrap of the major news items in Parliament this week. And that's curated for you in the recap segment. The House resumed sitting on Tuesday. The Speaker appeared in the chamber looking different. In his opening remarks, Alban Bagmin encouraged MPs to also don traditional outfit. He, however, gave the strongest indication yet that the highest standards of ethics we maintained in the House prevents the rancor that ensued in the last meeting. In view of the way the first session of the 8th Parliament of the Fourth Republic ended, without the closing remarks of the co-leaders and the Speaker, I direct that the Hunter Department should receive the written closing remarks of the co-leaders and capture them as so presented. I also attach my closing remarks to this statement and same shall be captured in the official re reports of Parliament as so presented, as so directs. The lessons of the first session have been learned by all of us and we should all pledge not to see a repeat of those violent nasty scenes, as well as pledge to defend and uphold the image of parliament. On the controversial e-levy, Majority Leader Oseche Mensabos indicated that the bill will be considered later on after further consultation. The bill will be scheduled for consideration by the House during the first week of the first meeting of the second session. However, upon consultation with the sponsoring minister, the committee is not able to program saying for this week after resumption, Honourable Minister of Finance is undertaking further engagement with stakeholders and sections of the general public in respect of some concerns that have been raised on the bill. The committee would, in all probability, Mr. Speaker, program the bill for consideration during the second week of this meeting. And honorable members are therefore encouraged to participate fully in the consideration and conclusion of the processes of the passage of the bill for the benefit of the economy. In response, the Minority Chief with Munta Kamubara called for consultations to be opened up further for the Finance Committee to receive memoranda from the public. The House of Parliament cannot get time to do consultation, but the Minister will so be allowed a whole week to go and do. And then he can to tell us in his consultation why he has. He has seen or he has heard. Why are we not, the General Committee, equally not going to make time for this House and for that matter the Finance Committee to engage the public? So that, yes, because that is how we carried bills in this House. That's because when the, the Human Value Bill, the anti, the anti, uh, what we call gay bill, comes to this House, even when we wanted that to be fast tracked, the committee is now calling the people in fights. 
Just five people. Come and let's hear you. And people are repeating the same point. Simply because the government side are not interested and they are delaying the passage of their bill. Now this one that we are saying that this time for proper consultation because it's going to even affect more people. That one, the house cannot do the consultation. The Minister for Land and Natural Resources, Samuel Jinapo, briefed MPs on the explosion at Bogoso Apiate. At a press briefing later on, he indicated that next week the government will commission a team made up of technocrats to conduct an inquiry into mining health and safety issues in the country. Broader examination so that we can learn the useful lessons out of the industry, the larger picture. What are the loopholes? Where do we have to tighten? The legal regime, is it sufficient? Um, the policy regime, is it sufficient? And God willing, next week, we're going to inaugurate a ministerial committee of technocrats who are going to conduct an inquiry, not just an inquiry into this incident, but an inquiry into the whole gamut of health and safety of mining in Ghana, and not just explosives, everything to do with health and safety of mining, so that out of that, we can have recommendations which will be implemented and to make our country a safe and healthy destination for mining. In keeping to its constitutional mandate, the majority leader announced a four-member committee on the floor of the House. The members are James Kluchaveji, Deputy Minority Leader, Navrongo Central MP, Samson Chiragia, Ishaeso MP, Dr. Stephen Amwa, and MP4, Upper Dentra East, Dr. Festus Kofi. This re recommends that the Honorable James Kluchaveji is made the chairman of the committee. The speaker, this is so because, one, this is an ad hoc committee, and second, that the Honorable James Kuche Abeji is the most senior member and also a member of the leadership who is part of this committee. And it's for that reason that, unlike what obtains in practice, making the majority caucus members the chairperson of any such committee. A statement on the abysmal performance of the Black Stars at the ongoing African Cup of Nations in Cameroon was made on the floor of the House by ranking member on the Youth Sports and Culture Committee, Kobna Mensah Oyomi. Other members of the House contributed to the statement. They had the opportunity of telling the whole country that they did not like the Siapia, who was then the coach. They brought in Sike Akuno, that he had performed badly. They brought him over and they have asked him to also go. And yet those who were doing the search and appointing the people, the Blaster Management Committee, continue to be in office. The FA has every right to remove that group. Tell those who are placed at the helm of affairs, of our football, they should mess up with the country. They should be. If I wanted, I certainly would have died that day. My condition would have been worse. And when I heard people, when I was lying in my bed, heard people shouting all over the world, I would have died. Yeah, I'm for Ghana is the only country when we go to play, God has to come to earth to be our defender or our goalkeeper or our striker. There are, if you take Comoros, the country which managed to uh, disgrace us. Three, two. Mr. Speaker, they don't have footballers even in Europe. But in Ghana, a minister, we have to think deep. The relationship between the ministry and the GFA in the name of autonomy. There are many qualified Ghanaian footballers like Juan Salisu of Southampton, Tariq Lamte of Brighton, Hassan Odoi of Chelsea, Afenye Jan of Roma. Brilliant Ghanaian footballers recognized at the world level, yet none of them was recognized by your coach, recognized by your technical bench. What kind of scouting did we do in Europe in preparing the team? Minister for Youth and Sports, Mustafa Yusif, placed the blame of the star's failure on poor technical direction. The Blaster have quality players. Mr. Speaker, we have Thomas, pa Thomas Pate of Arsenal who played in England, and every match, he's a regular player. We have Jordan Ayew of Crystal Palace, 
a regular player in the English Premier League. We have Baba Rahman of Reading. So individually, our national team have the players. But as whether they gel as a team is something that, that we have to all interrogate. And, and that is why normally every team will have the, a technical team as well to read and manage games. And we believe that this AFCON campaign, the technical team did not manage the games very well for our dear country. And it's as a result of that, Mr. Speaker, that the ministry asked the GFA to review and look at the various teams that form the Ghana uh, Blasters. The Speaker's scheduled medical review will take him out of the jurisdiction for a number of days. As it occurred previously, it is expected that this may have an impact on proceedings. The majority chief whip, Frank Anadon Press, says the development is worrying. I mean, I can't pretend about it. It's worrying and um, we have to put our heads together as, as a people or maybe leadership will have to uh, find a way of uh, helping the speaker find a solution to this because um, it's becoming one too many often and we also need to get the balance i mean he's the speaker and he's ill he's taking ill and he needs treatment is it the case that we can get an equally good uh, medical team to have this treatment done here these are questions we need to ask vis-a-vis -vis the fact that um, because of the nature of our parliament now and because we have extremely important uh, national duties to be prosecuted. So one would have thought that we'll find an alternative. On the floor of the House, the Speaker handed an ultimatum to the Youth, Sports and Culture Committee to complete its consideration of the Black Stars' poor performance at the ongoing Africa Cup of Nations with a report to the House by end of February. Is it possible that you can present this report by the end of February. Honorable members, I proceed to direct that the Committee on Youth and Sports should present to this House a report on the results of their investigation on the poor performance of the blasters by the end of February next month. Members deliberated on the accommodation crisis on public university campuses across the country after a statement was made by New Edubiasi MP Abdul Salam Adams. There are many depressing stories of how students struggle to find accommodation in our various public universities in the country. The arrangement in some of our public universities are that after paying tuition, students are required to apply and secure accommodation online. So, Speaker, this, arra this arrangement does not often work for many students, especially those in rural areas. The so Speaker, to assess the online portals, one needs fast and reliable internet, which is a challenge in many parts of the country. Even for those in our urban areas, the reports are that rooms are usually unavailable by the time students get the notification to log on to the portals. So, the Speaker, the cost of accommodation on campus is too high for the average parent. Hello and welcome back from the break. This is the From the Floor segment. Of course, Parliament is back from recess. On the front banner, it's the electronic transfer levy. Who uh, else other than the vice chairman of the finance committee, which is considering the bill, being the man to be spoken to today on this segment. Of course, he's one of my two guests in the segment. Welcome, your Honorable Patrick Yaboma. Thank you very much, Duke. Happy okay, New Year to you and your happy, team. Happy, happy New Year to you as well. Uh, so uh, let's start 
off from where we left off um, in relation to the electronic transfer levy, the E-Levy, Parliament degenerated into something else, shameful scenes, it's been condemned by a lot of people. Uh, but I want to find out from you, your committee is seized with this piece of legislation. Currently, where are we in relation to the E-Levy at the Finance Committee level? Uh, thank you very much and um, let me say good afternoon to your viewers and uh, to my constituents as well. Uh, currently, um, the Committee of Parliament has dealt with the e-levy mm. and a report has been presented to the floor for a debate on the policy. Okay. So it was at the time that we were going to debate the policy that you rightly described as some unfortunate scenes, which mm. I condemn as well, because it's in a civilized democracy where we've been elected to represent our people, we need to go through the motions as enshrined in our constitution mm. and also be responsible members and representatives of our people. So I condemn that act as well. Mm. So that, the policy uh, was voted for at committee, committee by a majority decision. Okay. Came to the floor, as you know, experienced as you are. Mm -hmm. Everything we decide in committee has to be approved on the floor. Yes. So the, the policy will be debated. There will be a continuation of the debate mm -hmm. and a vote on the floor mm -hmm. by the entire House okay. to determine whether we approve of the policy or not. So this will be second reading second before reading. consideration. Second yes, yes, yes. You understand the technology, <laughs> so I didn't want to confuse yeah. the listening public. Mm -hmm. So we will debate second reading, then we'll go to the consideration stage. Mm -hmm. That is where members could provide amendments to the bill. Mm -hmm. That's where we are now. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, we, we've been told, of course, um, this is... Um, from the majority leader, the leader of government business himself, that the sponsoring ministry wants to do some, some consultations. If this happens to affect the form and substance of the bill, that could mean that whatever work has been done will be withdrawn and a new and updated version will be relayed, which your committee will have to look at again. Well, it depends on the sort of consultations that will be made, mm. whether it will affect the form and substance. If it's material, then it has to be redrawn. If it's not, then we'll, we'll have to do the necessary adjustments. Mm -hmm. But our consultations have been made every day. Discussions go on. You hear party leaders speak on the, on the policy. For me, it has turned into a political party's position mm -hmm. on the bill. MPP is for it, NDC is against it. Mm -hmm. When this happens, in a civilized democracy, you put it to a vote, mm. and whatever the majority decides, so we carry on and uh, manage the affairs of the economy. A, a lot of arguments have been raised against this bill. Um, people have raised the argument of hardship in the country, this would add up to it. Um, others have raised the issue about the rate, 1.75, um, introducing it just like that. It could have been staggered over a period. Others even raised the argument of how much of a blow this would be to the digitization and digitalization drive of the, of the government to ensure that a lot more people are brought into the formal economy. A lot of people use mobile money account and, and the rest. And that this is a bad time for you to introduce this. There, there can never be a good time to introduce a tax mm. policy, especially if it's going to affect you and our yeah. pockets. There can never be a good time. Uh, VAT and any other tax policy. You can go and read a Hansard on NDC's position on the communication service tax. You can also read a Hansard on MPP's position on VAT and what have you. Nobody wants to pay so much mm -hmm. when it comes to tax. My question is, if the government of the day says that I'm pursuing an agenda of a Ghana beyond aid, yeah. where in the near future uh, we wouldn't be going to the markets to borrow, and that Ghanaians ought to 
take their destinies into their own hands. How do we do that? Mm. It is only through taxation. And I'm happy you, you read a lot. You can look, read around and look at the tax uh, policies of our neighboring mm -hmm. countries and even the advanced countries, yeah. how much they pay. It is through some of these tax policies that they are also able to recapitalize financial institutions, uh, inject uh, adequate resources into the private sector for us to go out there to borrow. Mm -hmm. You understand? So if you are taking certain steps, difficult as it is, we need to encourage government. Yes, I don't think Ghanaians are against the e-levy. Mm. No. There are those what, who are against what, it. What, what I know for a fact is that they want better transparency in the management of the resources that accrues mm -hmm. to government. That I agree, we must put in place the right measures to ensure that the leakages in our tax system, our revenue mobilization drive, and everything that brings money into the kitty, reduce the corruption at every level. Mm. So that we generate the right revenue, we can start e-levy at 1.5, mm -hmm. 1.75. Mm -hmm. But if we are able to generate so much and government is comfortable, government can even reduce it. Hardly does that ever happen. Yes. Even, even with trot you yes. know what? Yes. Even you when see? the fuel prices go down, they never you reduce see? it. So we shouldn't expect that when from government. When started, really. we said, oh, it was too high. Yes. Now VAT is almost around 19% or 20%. It's a bit... It's, <laughs> it's still it's, not it's, It started from, from somewhere. From 12% to 17.5 at a point now. It's yeah. even going up. Going up. Even additional so, levies have been added to it. So I'm saying that we need to start from a point. Okay. Yes. Nobody is saying that there isn't hardship in the system. There's hardship in the system. How do we pay the civil servants who are asking for pay rights? Mm -hmm. UTAG is on the necks of government. Mm -hmm. Uh, the uh, security service, mm -hmm. they, all, they want good salaries and conditions of service. Members of parliament do. But you can't talk about it. We always <laughs> talk about it, but hey, <laughs> you know that members of parliament are always uh, <laughs> being hit left and right, yeah. but uh, that's, that's not on the table mm -hmm. now. So everybody wants better conditions of service. How does the government satisfy them? Mm. 2.4 million people plus pay direct taxes. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine a, a country of 30.8, maybe let's say those within the tax bracket mm. is half, Enough. and you have just 2.4 million plus paying direct taxes. How do we rake in more revenue? You but it's government's job to do the hard thing, that is, to bring in a... That, that is to why government ensure is, that everybody that who enjoys these social services That is why government is tax. thinking hard and deep mm. to raise money through innovative means. Why will people react so negatively? Because people have been in certain businesses and they've never paid taxes mm. before. But you do, Duke, you and I, we do pay. You are asking for good roads. The good people of Okankwe Central, we want good roads. We've gotten a share. We want the Olengele area, mm -hmm. that's La Paz area, to have good roads, Abeka down south. You know, how do we rake in more revenue when somebody is just doing online business, making so much, and is not paying anything mm -hmm. to the government? Mm -hmm. You understand? People want to enjoy but they don't want to contribute. That is what I'm, I'm advising that, yes, we want the good things, good salary, good conditions of service, good roads. We want water in my village. Uh, we want interchanges in Kumasi. The loans we contract ought to be paid for. Mm -hmm. How do we raise revenue to pay for those loans that we contract? You looked at the other government obligations yeah. uh, report. It's about 35 billion in terms of interest rate yeah. that we are supposed to pay to service our mm. in, uh, uh, debt. How do we do that if we continue to uh, live within this mindset, with mm. this mindset of not having to raise revenue through innovative ways and also leave the uh, payment of taxes to just 
a section of the population. I think Ghanaians are willing and ready to pay, but they want adequate transparency in the administration so for your, your, and your, use of the resources that we raise. Obviously, the minority is not cooperating with you on this. That's, that's that border. That's that border. You saw it at first yeah. under the committee when well, you were working on the, well, on the bill. The minority ought to be convinced, mm -hmm. and we are doing that because, you see, MPP will not be in power forever. Mm. And much as I would have loved the minority and the party of the day to have got reached a consensus on this matter, my advice to them is that they should come on board. Let's start this program. They are the uh, opposition, mm. properly so-called, to keep asking the questions, to keep probing whether we are using the revenue so generated judiciously and it's in the proper way. Mm. That is the work of the opposition. Okay. Um, one of the reasons why um, matters degenerated on the floor of parliament in the last meeting was because of the absence of the speaker uh, for, for medical review. It's, uh, we're told that over this weekend, the speaker would also be jetting out again. And you are told. Yes, and no, this and this is from I mean reliably from from the leadership of the house. Okay. S some people believe that uh, this is becoming one too many. Looking at the fact that Parliament this is 137, 137, one Parliament, and any time the speaker is outside the jurisdiction, it becomes it becomes an issue which probably uh, can lead to I mean, further tensions on the floor of, of Parliament. Once he is back in his seat. The balance of power seems to be at, 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 at rest and at ease. W where do you stand on this? Stand Especially on, uh, the fact that the medical attention is being sought outside the country. Well, uh, it's within the speaker's right to seek medical attention. As to his terms and conditions of service, I'm unaware. If it's part of his conditions of service, then he's entitled to it. But the Speaker occupies a very important role in our Parliament. He doesn't have a vote, he doesn't participate in debates. But the Speaker must manage the affairs of the House to reflect the image of Parliament, yeah. especially in times like mm -hmm. this. So I, 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 I would want the Speaker to be very, very permanent in the Chamber, let me put it that way, especially in times like mm -hmm. this. I'm not saying he should not take good care of himself. We all wish him well and pray for him. But in times like this, he ought to also sacrifice a bit for the country. Well, the speaker doesn't program the business of government. It's a business committee chaired yeah, by the majority, majority leader. leader. And they, they brief him in conclave. So if the speaker, like you said, I'm not aware, is traveling um, this weekend, you said, mm -hmm. then I'm sure due consultation must go on so that they know when he's coming back to be able to table the business of the day, which will include the e-levy uh, transaction bill, so that he will preside and each and every member who has the right to vote participates in the voting process. Very well. Uh, let's, let's make progress. The finance minister in the, in the budget I mean, before introducing E-Levy, which has been the elephant in the room, as he calls it, it's a fact that this is a measure of burden sharing to ensure that every citizen at least bears a part of the, of the country's debt burden. Mm. Right? This E-Levy is expecting to raise about a billion dollars, 619 billion Ghana cities from it. The question is, I mean, over the period, this new year, when the uh, rating agencies, global financial institutions, uh, global business news outlets are doing projections and putting our ratings and the rest. Ghana's credit ratings has dropped in, in a manner that has not been witnessed before from Fitch. Uh, we are waiting for SMP, we are waiting for Moody's. Well, what, what, what would come after that? The country seems to be in a bad position. Well, um, um, Fitch came out with a B minus yes. or negative rating, I'm sure. If I read, I, I read something on that. Uh, report from that report 
I haven't seen anything from SNP mm. and, um, and Moody's. And Moody's. Mm -hmm. Government has always indicated that it needed to show up its revenue. Mm. And um, Fitch. Fitch, based on available data, I'm sure, did their own research and came out with their ratings. Mm. But I believe that we are putting in place the right measures to get out of the woods because we've been at B positive before and B yeah. plus. Yeah. And uh, I think we have to do more to engender the confidence mm -hmm. of the investor community. The investor community looks at issues on the floor of parliament. Yeah. Excuse my language, our misbehavior. They look at the conduct of government. They look at government expenditure and the priorities of government to make those projections. So I think um, if Fitch has downgraded us to be negative, it's also good for government. With a negative outlook? Oh, let me finish with my. It's also good to give an indication to government that look, the investor world are looking, it's looking at us. How do we get out of this? We can't continue in this, uh, on, on this uh, tangent, mm -hmm. or on this pattern. Let's put in place the right measures. What did the Minister of Finance do? I'm not saying he reacted to mm -hmm. Fitch's uh, ratings, but he said he's cut down expenditure mm -hmm. by a what percentage? 20 percentage That's point. Too. If the ceiling in the budget was 145 billion mm -hmm. expected to be raised, and he's cut about down. About 20 percent. You are talking about close to 30 billion mm -hmm. cities. You understand? That expenditure cut was what some of us were talking about. I'm mm -hmm. sure you read. Yeah. So the Minister of Finance is also listening and taking certain measures to bring back the economy in, in line with what the global investor community will look at. So government expenditure is being looked at. Mm. But once you look at government expenditure, you have to also look at the revenue Venus, side. Yeah. Because if Fitch, Moody's, and, uh, and, and uh, Standard and Poor's, SMP, SMP, Standard and Poor, also do the analysis and see that, oh, look here, government is cutting down expenditure, raising revenues, additional revenues are coming in. I can tell you, within the next three months, they will, they will come back with a revised uh, rating for the, for the country, which will be also positive. Once you don't do well in a subject in an academic year, you ask yourself questions. How am I going to improve? We do that to our children, mm. ask them questions. So it's, uh, there are checks and balances, and uh, All right. I, well, I believe we must. Uh, let, let's end on a, on a spot in our Black Stars, I mean, uh, bundled out first round west since the Boaké debacle in the 80s. You are calling for a very radical measure that the country should exit all international competitions for a number of years to rebuild. What is the assurance that if we do that, our football will be back on track? Yes, I said if need be. Okay. If need be, you examine yourself. We, we all love football. The country loves football. It's one sport that unites the country. True. So if that sport unites us, and we go out there and disappoint and come home with one point, that means you are not putting in the right strategies to unite the country. Yeah. So what are the issues? Player selection. Do we call the right players? Do we have a player selection board that looks at our players from domestic and internationally? Or is there a national team coach who says, I'm visiting players in Europe, I'm going to Asia, I'm going to Africa, uh, Australia to monitor? Do we have the right structures in place to monitor our players? That is the question. If we have the right structures in place, that means we'll be able to get the right players in place. Secondly, those who are refusing to play or those who are not honoring national calls, what strategies 
are we putting in place to get their side of the story? Mm. To know why they don't want to play for the national team? Quite a lot of them. A lot of them. Mm. A lot of them. I'm not a football administrator, mm -hmm. but I have done some investigation mm. and tried to convince some of them. Okay. And a couple of them. I spoke to the auntie of Tarek Lamte, who happened to be a former MC for Konongo. Oh. Yes. So when some of us speak, it's not as, speak as if we speak just in a vacuum. We also do some work quietly to encourage some of the players. I was on the flight with Carlo Hassan Odue on Monday night from London to Accra. Mm. Spoke with his brother, spoke with his... His father uh, played for the Black Stars. Yeah, so I spoke. Be. His father was on the flight. Mm, yeah. They, they came in. As a family. Question is, something is not right. That is why you don't get that excitement from the boys. Mm. Footballers have a lot of ego. True. You need to manage it. There are young men coming up. They are professionals. You need to manage them. Otherwise, hey, it's your profession because they play between 17 and 35. And they That's are, it. yeah, nobody will employ them. So they also manage their professional lives well. You understand? So you ask yourself, why are these guys not coming? So that inquiry has to be in depth to ascertain why some of these top players are not coming. Why would they come for vacation and not play for our national team? Uh, Memphis Depay yeah. comes here. Mm. Uh, uh, this gentleman who was at Manchester United. Uh, Timothy Fosumensa. Fosumensa comes around. Hasinodwe mm. comes. So they've, they've why don't they play for our fight. national team? That's the inquiry I was talking about. On that note, we'll end our discussion here. We'll take a break. When I come back, I'll be... So originally, we had um, was scheduled for us to bring you an interview with a member of the minority on the issues regarding the e-levy and matters arising. But there's been a subsequent development. The members of the minority caucus, um, by an edict from their leadership, are not allowed to comment further on the matter of the e-levy uh, up until conclusions. There's a conclusion in the negotiations with government. So we had already scheduled an interview with a number of high-ranking members of the minority on the e-levy. But because of this uh, position which they've been whipped into line that they are not supposed to grant interviews, um, we cannot bring you that interview, which would have been a direct reaction to what the vice chairman of the committee, the finance committee, the Honorable Patrick Obama, uh, told us in that interview that we've just aired. Now, in place of that, we are bringing you excerpts of a debate that took place on the floor of parliament uh, on the Black Stars, their performance, at the ongoing AFCON, uh, where they crashed out of the first round with just a point, which is the worst performance of the Black Stars in the African Cup of Nations history. Enjoy. Abysmal or poor performance of the Black Stars at the 16th African Cup of Nations ongoing in Cameroon. And Mr. Speaker, to share the disappointment of Ghanaians in our Black Stars is certainly not encouraging, not the best, not inspiring, and does not even encourage us to want to invest more as we look forward to participating in Qatar, the World Cup, in Qatar 2022, late this year. But Mr. Speaker, whilst commending the maker of the statement, I should also indicate that I've enjoyed the inputs that our colleagues have made, and <clears throat> we have noted that the Minister for Youth and Sports is here. But Mr. Speaker, just to give my caution that we should manage this process gingerly because we still have a major qualifier with Nigeria to determine our fate as far as the World Cup in Qatar is concerned. You have to play a major match, a 23rd match against Nigeria. 
So between now and March, how do you manage the transition of a coach, coach whose performance you are unhappy about or you are dissatisfied about? And Mr. Speaker, to note further, and probably my strongest recommendation is, what is our objectives? And Minister, we are yet and we are unable to recover from the continuing humiliation of the Black Stars. And we need to take note of it and build a team. But Mr. Speaker, our expectations were also too high. What is the nature of the Black Stars of Ghana today? Minister, you know for a fact that you went into this game with our 17 debutants. 17 of our players were young players. So if you go in, the nature of your team, it was a young team. It's not the Black Stars of Abedi Pele, the Black Stars of Tony Yepua, and the Black Stars of uh, Samuel Osei Kufo. No, you had as many young debutants as 17 in this particular category. To sack or not to sack, Mr. Speaker, I may not even offer an opinion. Local or foreign, I may not offer an opinion. But Mr. Speaker, the GFA management and the Minister of Youth and Sports, how was Milo, Milovac determined? Mr. Speaker, the facts are that a committee of three was put in place and given 72 hours. At that time, Minister, you didn't raise questions. We didn't raise questions. Do you determine a coach 72 hours? So within 72 hours, a certain determination was made. And the de determination was made of Milo. There are many other concerns that we can share. Then your technical bench, Minister, when you came here and made a statement and asked for national support, we assured you, but your technical bench, beyond the coach, the life of Tony Balfour, Tony uh, Yebua, Samuel Osei Kufuo, Stephen Apia and Co, they are all still around. Even if you want to constitute them into some advisory group to assist, they can. But Mr. Speaker, our difficulty now is where the minister is confronted with a, witch, with a witch's dance. If he dance forward, the father will die, he dance backwards, the mother dies. So he has to be dancing in the middle. Does he have a mandate and authority to dismiss a coach? Does the minister for youth and sports have the authority and mandate to dismiss the minister for youth and sports? Is the FA, not him, but he reflects our disappointment, he, the minister, because he's in parliament. How I wish parliament could just pass a resolution and say that go home. But we cannot, because we must follow the specific rules and regulations governing football. We are not happy about his performance, but we have a major transition between now and when we face Nigeria in the World Cup qualifiers. And Mr. Speaker, it is also true that probably, uh, 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 i just give you two examples. There are, if you take Comoros, the country which managed to uh, disgrace us, 3-2. Mr. Speaker, they don't have footballers even in Europe. But in Ghana, a minister, we have to think deep. The relationship between the ministry and the GFA in the name of autonomy. There are many qualified Ghanaian footballers like Juan Salisu of Southampton, Tariq Lamte of Brighton, Hassan Odoi of Chelsea, Afenye Jan of Roma. Brilliant Ghanaian footballers recognized at the world level. Yet none of them was recognized by your coach, recognized by your technical bench. What kind of scouting did we do in Europe in preparing the team? Yeah, so here we are. Ghana blasters. I mean, we hear about sex, segmentation. We we'll hear about infighting. They are only 22 or 23. They represent the population of over 30 million. Football is our staple. I mean, quite a few colleagues I don't get on with on this side. I mean, Kufibua, those I don't. 
notwithstanding that we can sit in the same coffee room and watch football, laugh, and when we get out of there, we can uh, resume our hostilities. It is the only thing, Mr. Speaker, that brings us together as a nation. And yet, the plaster consistently, Mr. Speaker, lets us down. After, uh, how do you call it, 20, uh, 2007, 2008? We remember that one. Mr. Speaker, as a modern, reported me to President Kufo that had made statements to the effect that they were messing with our hearts. So Mr. Kufo, the President, should do whatever was in his power, I think, to punish me or something. I wasn't there, but Mr. Speaker, you know, even walls have years. Those who were there came and told me, my friend, you are in trouble. What about that? I said, we can supported you to the President. President Kufo, what about that? Well, the president has got so much national matters on his mind. I'm sure this one it would escape you. So I waited for a call and the call didn't come. I've never been happy with Asamoyan up to today. And come to think about it, look at what he did to you as a penalty. You see, it is a very serious matter. When it comes to blasters, it comes to all of us. Let me let you into a little secret. I'm so sure if I hadn't left this country or sometime when I was young and I followed football the way I used to do with all my heart, maybe I'll be a dead goat by now. You come to listen to commentary, watch protocol, playing matches, and the speaker, this match, leader remembers fairly well. I called the team Kagbo Warriors. You told me the other day they weren't called Kagbo Warriors, they called Kagbo or something Warriors. This is where we play them here at Crossbow Stadium. Major Lamte, Arnold Warriors. No, Kagbo, it wasn't Zambia. Arnold. Eh? Zambia, Kagbo, no, it's not Arnold. Kagbo Warriors. Kagbo. 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 Ah, Kabo, Kabo, it's fine. That's their name, Mr. Speaker. So we played at our class for Sebiomi, yeah? We didn't have the international referee. There was a major Lante Ghanaian referee, Mr. Speaker, who officiated. Speaker, we scored as many as five goals. Three of them were the Salam. I collapsed. I was only about, how many years? Ten years, whatever. Speaker, football is a very serious business in Ghana. You journalists, Tell those who are placed at the helm of affairs, of our football, they shouldn't mess up with the country. They shouldn't. If I wanted, it, I certainly would have died that day. My condition would have been worse. I mean, I heard people, when I was lying in my bed, heard people shouting all over the world, I would have died. Ghana is the only country when we go to play, God has to come to earth to be our defender or our goalkeeper or our striker. I mean, God has got so much to do, but he's always calling to aid. So, yeah, there was some little thing I clip I watched on this. This guy, you know what I mean? I think he made the point. He said to the whole country, that listen, as far as he was concerned, it was a serious business today. What he was going to do was that he was going to eat to his fullest satisfaction. Two things. If we win, well, he's already had uh, enough to eat, so there's no need to eat it again. But if we lose, which he knew we definitely were going to lose, he had already eaten, so he will just sleep. Those of you who want it. Yeah, my friend says, the big castle, big castle. It shows how much passion there is about football in Ghana. I've listened to their various concerns and we will take them into consideration as far as our sports development is concerned. Mr. Speaker, I thank you so much for the opportunity to contribute and respond to some of the issues. City TV is live on DSTV. Go to channel 363.
On Go TV, Access City TV on channel 182. On a digital TV, please press the menu button on the remote control and run a new search on your TV. Take note that without an antenna, you cannot access City TV on your television. City TV can be accessed on a free to air digital box like the Go TV and Star Times box. City TV, it's your world. Welcome back from the break. This is Duke's View. Uh, well, this is uh, the very first week in the first meeting of the second session of Parliament. So it's, it's, it's very refreshing and, and, and great to be back. And of course, the ELV is, is, is on the front banner once more. Uh, it is my hope and it's our view on this platform that the consultations that are actually going on uh, which is preventing Parliament from continuing with its work on the bill, would actually be far-reaching. In fact, we will suggest that let's have, apart from the town hall meeting which government is organizing this week, and the fact that it has actually um, met the minority group, even though um, at a point, or as we speak, we're told that that meeting ended inconclusively and in, and in a deadlock. It is our hope that these consultations will actually have an impact would have an impact in the final bill that would be approved by parliament it's important because this matter of of course the canons of taxation and taxation itself is is one that you cannot build a nation without of course taxes are very important very very important to the building of a nation but in crafting such tax policies and tax measures it is important that the buying of the people um, is factored in, especially with this task, with this uh, tax service tax, which would require that a lot more people would continue using these digital platforms so that government can rake in the money it has projected 6.9 billion annually per the current projections. So it's important that the buying of the citizenry is, is actually harnessed in such discussion. So that is why we are asking that the consultations be far reaching. They should have a place, not just because government wants to be seen to be sensitizing and consulting people. So, town hall meeting here and then, then nothing happens. It's just the same old, same old that was before parliament before recess. That one gets passed. No. There should be a bearing. There should be a bearing of the consultations on what gets approved on the floor of parliament. And if possible, open it up. Let's have a public forum. Let everybody come and present. The Tax Justice Coalition, Mobile Money Association, they've petitioned parliament. Let's give them a voice. To be heard before the finance committee apart from what the ministry of finance is doing so that we can have a good a, a good policy measure secondly uh, the speaker announced an extension of the vaccine mandate to parliament in that no vaccination no entry which is actually going on across many other government institutions uh, that's also that's that's i mean of course it's in keeping in line with what government generally wants to do but the speaker wants to extend that to a booster vaccine to say that if you don't have a booster, a booster vaccine, after the booster vaccination exercise, which is currently underway in Parliament, is over, you will not be allowed within the presence of Parliament. Mr. Speaker, on this measure, please hasten slowly. Hasten slowly, because there are a lot of people who have not even taken the, 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 the vaccination. The first and second jabs, I know some of my colleagues in the parliamentary press who have not even taken it. So that is even an issue in its own. So, but for you to add booster vaccine and make it compulsory and say that if you don't have the booster vaccine please let's the house should the speaker please hasten slowly on your directive at least there should be a second round of the booster vaccine because as of today the exercise is ending and i know a lot of journalists and a lot of other auxiliary workers in parliament who have not even taken the vaccine so mr speaker hasten slowly on this no vaccine, no entry, especially with regards to no booster vaccine. It's the booster vaccine I'm talking about, not the jab. The booster vaccine uh, policy and its ramifications, that's what I'm talking about. So, Mr. Speaker, hasten slowly on that. That's how we wrap up this week's edition of Views View and by extension the chamber right here on CCTV. Of course, we are on your television 
at this same at, on the same time, the same time next week on this very very platform. My name is Duke Ben Sopoku. Enjoy the very best of our programming.